Hi there, and welcome to the live stream. Just a little bit of housekeeping. If you want to ask a question, if you could kindly type it in the chat with Q, Q, Q in front of it so we really see it so clearly. If you want to jump on the queue, then you can do a super chat, which will give you priority over everybody else. But also, the most important thing is it supports the channel. So don't forget to like, share and subscribe if you really enjoy the show if you want to put a comment in that'd be great too anyway sit back and enjoy the live stream hope you enjoy it well <laughs> i don't know what you thought of that but that's my little new thing uh just to sort of get away from saying the same thing time and time again Welcome to the live stream. It's 7 p.m. in State Controlled Britain, and um, it's very nice to see a few people have already asked some questions, which is great. Obviously, you will see it's just me in the studio because Richard Smith is currently in Spain. He's given a talk out there. He was brilliant at the Keto Brain Health Conference yesterday on Saturday, which is great. It's Sunday today, obviously. So it's just me, folks. So I think there is a couple of questions that relate to Richard. Uh, I do apologize that uh, he's not here. So maybe I'll sort of give you a, a quick go over and then maybe we can sort of flush that out or flesh that out, I should say. So I'm obviously moderating and also doing the questions myself tonight. So do bear with me as I go through the questions. There are some super chats. So both Dennis and Mark, I uh, will get to yours first and then we will go to the questions that are slightly before. But anyway, so the super chats, as I said in that video just then, the introduction video will get you to go ahead. And as it's just me, you never know, we might actually get through all the answers to all the questions tonight. So you just never know, do you? So let's go to Mark's for questions. No, oh, Dennis has actually given me um, five. Yeah five pounds look at that that's fantastic so yeah so dennis we're going to do your question first you were the first person to do a super chat as well so that's great and it's in wow it's in four parts so we'll read each part and part one 110 days on strict carnivore mostly red meat add or oh, sorry odd egg two meals a day 1 30 p.m and 6 30 p.m air fryer or grill 1.5 to 2 kilograms of meat per day around two liters of water per day Part two says, I don't drink water for two hours after each meal. Upset stomach every night. Only have the stomach issue from around 8 or 9 p.m. at night. Not during the day for whatever reason. Part three is saying, stomach feels nauseous to start, then gurgles. Then cramp, pains, then diarrhea for a night. Then no bowel movement for a day or two, but same symptoms. Then diarrhea for the third night. So uh, that's sort of the highlight. There are the gurgles and the cramp pains and diarrhea. And uh, then we've got the fourth part here. Part four, male, 50 years old, five foot eight, eight stone, seven pounds, tried sea salt, electrolytes, no filler, digestive enzymes, eight shield, betine, um, I always pronounce that wrong, pepsine, up to seven tablets per meal, ox bile before and after every meal. Well, that, that's a lot of supplements for a start. So I think that's one of the things I, I would say is possibly there's a bit too much supplementation going on and therefore you're not going to um, get the full benefit of your body working. So when did you say you said you've done 110 days, I think, of strict carnivore? So I'm wondering why you're still using those supplements. Well, maybe you're using, maybe you've listed the sort of things that you've tried. At first, firstly, just globally, if you try any supplement, like ox bile, for instance, what you're doing is you're not letting your bile production, your natural bile production, catch up or be where it should be. So sometimes that can be a bit of a, a bit of a problem. For, so you never adapt, basically. So if we go through the list of what you've got, so uh, digestive enzymes, well, they may be helpful for some people initially, for instance. But if you take digestive enzymes, it does accelerate the breakdown of food in your stomach, basically, and, and your small intestine. So this is going to increase gas production and the gurgling. OK, so anything actually that, that, that does that, that accelerates the breakdown of food in this in this way, in the in this area, in the stomach, in the intestine. Beyond its normal speed, then you can get some gurgling. Um, and also, once you get that 
um, changing your digestive system. So it isn't all about speeding up or slowing it down. It's about doing what works because very stellis, the sort of, you know, the, the flowing of your small intestine is about 11 flows per minute. And we have a certain amount of stomach acid. And it's many people think we eat food and our body just acts on it. But food also signals out. So as it breaks down, the body picks up the what's being broken down. So, for instance, taurine is, a, you know, one that we know quite a lot about. And um, that will signal to produce a certain amount of stomach acid. It will also increase, modulate, regulate the stomach emptying. So, you know... What's in the food tells the stomach what to do. So the stomach acidity is worked out by that. So if you sort of biohack with these sort of things, you're going to have a few problems. And so I know when people first go carnivore, just to broaden it out for everybody, I'm trying to give you value for your super chat, by the way, um, they can't digest enough fat, for instance. So they, they really struggle because they, they, they've been told to do one meal a day, for instance, and oh, I can't get enough fat in, so I... When I do try, it's too much for my body, so I'm going to take supplements. I'm going to take some sort of ox bile. Well, may maybe that isn't the answer. Maybe the answer is to have three meals a day just when you start. And they're just the same volume of food, but just split over three meals, so it's a bit easier. And as you eat this way more, your body starts to adapt. So hopefully that sort of made sense. So, so the other thing that happens, when you have this really accelerated breakdown of food, there's a, what's called an osmotic effect because everything's beautifully timed. So if there's a rapid breakdown of food, there will be more uh, water being drawn into the intestines. So that could actually produce a looser stools, give you diarrhea as well. So that would be one of the things that would, um, that would definitely be uh, an effect from digestive enzymes. I'm not saying they're bad, by the way, and people do sort of cherry pick what they hear. I'm just saying from the question... The possibility of the gurgling and the pain. So the pain would also be certain enzymes, digestive enzymes, can actually uh, lead to some sort of irritation of the, the lining of the gut. So that could be the pain. So the same same with the HCL. You've increased the acidity. So again, what we've done here is we've increased the speed of the digestion. So that alone can generate some gurgling because that's that's what we've done. So I'm trying to moderate, by the way, on my own, as well as answer questions. So if I keep looking at the, the questions that are coming in, trying, trying to keep on top of everything is a bit difficult. So anyway, you've got this increased acidity and the faster digestion again. That's going to be irritating. Gastric irritation is definitely going to happen. And again, that could irritate the stomach lining, cause you those pains. All right. So the motility of the gut is again altered. So we're looking at faster transit times in some instances. So what's going to happen there is you might actually be evacuating really quickly and that's what the diarrhea is. So the next day, you're not going to produce anything at all because the food has been whizzed through and, um, you know, it's gone from going in, ingesting, digesting, and then defecation is out and, and then it might take a couple of days to get back into that cycle. So all of these things are going to do that to you. They're going to sort of change your your digestive patterns, your speed, your acidity, your stomach emptying, which is really important. And obviously, you know, your toilet habits. So when you take the, you know, the bile acid, so we can, I'm going through all the things that you've listed there. Um, this will stimulate, obviously, uh, you will uh, have more bile, basically, in your system. That will stimulate bowel movements because that's part of what bile does. It emulsifies the fats. It's also part of the cleansing of the small intestine in the GI tract, pushing out more stuff. So that, that could actually potentially cause some diarrhea as well because, it, it, again, it's speeding up. Fat malabsorption is a big issue, which is why people take the ox bile, but sometimes you can just take a bit too much and that can interfere with your body's own natural fat absorption mechanism as well because uh, basically there's too much emulsification going on. Obviously, same thing. It's going to lead to GI sort of irritation. Certainly, I wouldn't do a mix of all those things because, you know, with, with the ox bile, again, you're going to increase the motility of the gut and, and increase the possibility of diarrhea. Now, all of the things together will, will obviously really heighten everything all the way through, you know. So it's sort of like, it's a, uh, you know, it's a supplement stack that has all these potential problems. So maybe one of them would be okay. So just, again, being broad, if you are looking to come to this way of eating or it's not really working out for you when you first started, 
and you're not absorbing fat, for instance, if if you come from low um, low calories or you know low fat calorie restriction, you've got to remember all those things are nutrient restrictions or or low nutrients, micronutrients. You know, so that everything is 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 not good with that way of um, you know eating. So we've now got our full range of nutrients, and they are all of those things that. Uh, <laughs> Could cause problems by taking all of those things at once and influencers are very very compelling and convincing when they talk about these things and they all work for certain people certain periods of time maybe not so much but together you know it could could be simple things like the dosage maybe you're taking too much i mean i think uh, one of the things you said you take before and after the meal that might might be could be you know could simply be too much could be just you're very sensitive to to one of the supplements and the other ones are fine. So that like, you know, the timing is really important. We want to make sure that you are timing all of these things. Are you taking some of the supplements on an empty stomach? That possibly is about the worst thing you can do in this particular scenario. So all of those, all of those things. I mean, I don't like to talk about my, my consultations because this is not what this is about. It's free or, you know, a super chat obviously is a, is a, is a sort of voluntary payment that someone's made, which is great. And I really appreciate it. But these are the sort of things, sometimes a consultation will really resolve because you could send me pictures of what you're eating. You do like a mood and food diary and we could really dial, dial down to what's actually happening. And in the end, the price of the consultation saves you so much time uh, um, and uh, money on supplements. So I think the key to the answer really is try to work with your body a little bit more because I think that that's a thing and try not to sort of throw everything at it. You know, I hope that makes sense, Dennis. So, so if it doesn't make any sense, you can always email me and follow us. You know, I, say, I did I, I did a live question. and But hopefully the sort of general advice is go back to basics. Let your body do a bit more work and uh, don't be frightened of smaller meals with a bit more frequency. Yeah, I know we don't want to raise insulin and all that, but let's get the digestion working. Obviously, there could be some underlying GI issue. Don't really know. You know, it's not a one-to-one -one relationship. I haven't done a health and activity profile. But if you was to look into this with a coach, it doesn't have to be me. I'm just saying, I think, you know, they would all ask for the same things. Lots of, lots of background about, have you had GI distress before? Or have you had leaky gut, IBS, IB, IBD, whatever. There may be some other things that you could do. So hopefully that's helped you. So that that's great. Uh, great question. Thank you. That's really good. And Mark J. Thank you. One ninety nine. It all helps. Every little helps. Going to do that question now. So Carney over three years recently dropped salt from fifteen grams a day to one gram. Now this is a really interesting subject at the moment because I've had a few people with consults and we've dropped the salt and you know they've had dramatic improvements and weight loss of course. You know one of the big things that people don't and it's not just water weight by the way. We're talking about body fat as well. That overconsumption of salt can be problematic for some people. Please listen carefully, because it's not for everybody. Every some people may need a lot of salt, and and that's definitely something that I've seen. People need to up their salt. In the occasional case, dropping the salt has been remarkable. One of the people that I'm dealing with is in our school community, and she's dropped, I think, nine pounds, and it's just been taking the salt out. So that's been pretty good. Anyway, right. So I went off the top. Yeah. So sorry, Mark. Yes, Akani over three years recently dropped salt from 15 grams a day to one gram. I take keto prior electrolytes. I feel better, skin better too. I enjoy bodybuilding. And here's the part two. Uh, liked carb load at times around training. Would rather not though. Well, I'd rather you didn't as well. White rice, flat without them. Uh, any tips? I'm from the same town as Richard. Do you still do consults in person? Well, uh, I'm assuming that's for Richard. And I don't know if Richard does consults in person. I should imagine he does. I don't really know. Like I say, you know, he's, he's in Spain at the same conference as uh, Natasha Kemba, Mark Bride and uh, Dr. Anthony Chafee speaking there. Because he's our main man, Richard. You know, so, you know, he loves it over, the, over there, apparently. He's, he's messaged me today. He's having a great time. So uh, let's go to the, to the answer from, from me. But I do think Richard would like to probably chime in on this as well. Not here. So, you know, maybe in the school community or maybe next week. Right. Why do you, pref uh, why do you carb load? Why do people carb load? Well, if, if the, this way of eating, obviously, the little bit of, you know, glycogen, a little bit of water retention, your muscles look a bit bigger. Some people believe that they perform better. And I am not one to argue. If they feel that is what's happening, that's fine. 
But most people, when they're fully fat adapted, prefer not to have carbs. So my tip would be to be patient. Vitamin B is a big thing. Patience is a big thing. I, I, I suppose the longest person I've had to fat adapt was an endurance cyclist. And it took her a year to fully fat adapt. Once she'd fully fat adapted, you know, her performance was just through the roof. It was just amazing. Now, that's a long time. That was someone that was doing consults with me as well. So holding her hand all the way along, giving her a little bit of, uh, you know, uh, encouragement that she's on the right track, that does really help because if, if after six months it hasn't happened for you, that can be very frustrating. So I think for you, Mark, um, you know, um, get, in, get in contact with, with Richard. At, at Keto Pro, there's a contact form there, unless you've got his email already. And I think, you know, just ask him if he would do a consult in person. I'm sure he would. I oh, certainly he would do um, as much as he can to help you because, you know, that's what we're that's what we're here for. So hopefully that's answered your question. I've just noticed another super chat coming in. So I'll just go to that one and then let's have a look. Let's have a look at this one. Right. OK. Would you mind if I had a sip of drink? It is just me. You see, this is why I need that other person. Because I, I have had uh, a, a busy weekend. So, there we go. Right, let's have a look. Uh, bacon of health. Recovering from severe sleep problems with bad... Well, I'm saying that's circadian rhythm. I use lion's mane, magnesium, blue blockers and grounding. How to rid lion's mane and sleep well from carnivore alone. I also have red light therapy. Well, I mean, I think this is one of the things where you need to experiment. I might have a document about this. I might have a PDF. Uh, let me just have a look if I can get it. I've, on my own, it's a bit difficult. Let me see if I can get it. I don't want it to be too boring. If I can't find it very quickly, um, I will uh, get on. So, yeah, I, it, it's, a, it's a bit rude to keep looking at the screen. If, it, if, it's, if it's helping you, why do you want to get off it? Is it because you feel that you want to just do things more naturally? Which which I totally understand. If you've got bad circadian rhythms, what does that mean? Does that mean that, that there's a work problem causing you to have bad circadian rhythms? Or is it you just don't feel that you're operating correctly? One of the things I would say is, is try to get into good habits. That's the first thing. When you, when you have trouble with sleep, these things help. All the supplements help. I suppose this is going to be a theme from the first 20 minutes about dealing with your body and trying to get more back back into nature rather than dealing with supplements, for instance. I'm not anti-supplements, as you know. But anyway, sleep. One of the things I think is really quite a root solution is to get into a habit, right? Your body does like habits, okay? In this particular instance, when we're talking about sleep. So I would, I would try to go to bed at the same time. And I would also try to get up at the same time. But, you know, regulate it with trying to get up when the sun is coming up, rather than always at 7 o'clock. That would be the first thing. If that doesn't work with your lifestyle, if you go to work and you've got children or family and stuff like that, and you have to get up at 7 or 6.30 to do the kids' breakfast or something, that's fine. Because that's a habit of a different different sort, but and that will still work. Then when you get to, you know, nighttime, try to keep away from devices. I know everybody probably in this room has heard all this, but just in case you haven't or you need a little reminder, Keeping away from blue light. So, for instance, I now have a screen as a blue light blocker built in, which is uh, fantastic. It's more difficult to read, strangely enough, but I haven't adapted to it yet. Keep away from mobile phones, devices, tablets, everything like that, if you can. Try not to trigger yourself. Try not to have bright lights on, fluorescent lights. All those things that can disturb your patterns. You want natural light if you possibly can or as much as you can getting into your eyes, or lack of artificial light getting into your eyes as well. I think that would be good. Try not to have stimulants before you go to bed. So, for instance, I do have a cup of coffee there. I've decided to have one or two every so often. Uh, that's a decaf, a Swiss water decaf. So don't try to stimulate yourself. Even tea has caffeine in. And uh, what I would do is I would continue with the blue blocking and the grounding. Recently, we've, we've got a grounding sheet on the bed and uh, we also test the grounding sheet to make sure it is still working, which you can get a little meter to, to test it. This is the second one we've had to send back because it stopped working. So I would always check all my grounding equipment, uh, but obviously the best way to ground is to get, get out 
get outside barefoot and all that but early morning sunlight is excellent especially if it's barefoot even in the cold a little bit of cold therapy is not going to kill you you know it's going to make you stronger actually uh, so the grounding blue blockers that's really good magnesium i suppose of the things that you've mentioned their lines main to magnesium i would probably keep the magnesium in but some people that that doesn't work because it gives you other issues i think the sort of the 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 ngf that's coming from lion's mane you know the nerve growth factors uh, neurotropic effects basically yeah i think it works for some people but if you feel like you don't want to use it i definitely get that the red light therapy again that's 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 looking at your metabolism and you know all these things should should really be helping you but maybe you're just timing it wrong i think that's one of the things i would say is to sort of go back to as basic as you possibly can a nice regular rhythm and look at some good habits create some good habits don't drink too much throughout the day as well because if you're getting up at night to urinate then you are drinking too much because that's breaking your sleep cycle or you're drinking too late in the day. So I would look at that. You know the old thing about, oh, granddad, I'm not having any tea. You can't have tea past six o'clock in the evening. Well, that, that's because, you know, your bladder control and uh, your uh, your body does actually get to the point where it's not so easy to hold it in, and therefore you have to get up. And that would disturb your sleep, and it's a very vicious cycle. So you need to really look at your urine. We've got a question about urine coming up. You know, if, it, if your urine is clear then you're drinking too much and that will have a knock-on effect peeing at night is not a, not a healthy habit that's not a good thing so look at all of those things and hopefully hopefully that will be helpful i'm going to go back to the live questions now if that's okay and we've got people here helping me my food addiction is saying don't forget to hit the thumbs up for our host thank you very much yes please don't forget that would be really great and we're going to go to i'm just going to double check that there's not a another super chat and we'll go back to the order that we were in people put their questions in before we even started so that was great so family so i wonder if well, i wonder if that's just the surname is it like mr or mrs owen family anyway uh, how much did how much water did a modern hunter gathers drink a day how about our ancestors do we have any evidence of how much water they consume how much do other wild animals carnivores consume in comparison that's the question there. Like I say, do excuse me for moderating this so slowly today. I suppose it's very difficult to tell you across the board. I think we've got the Kalahari Desert, the people that live there. They drink, this is a desert. They drink as little as one litre of water a day. And they're doing fine. Now, they're in a desert. Okay, so but they drink to thirst. And we talk about this all the time on this channel, or I certainly do, because a decade of doing bloods, bloods aren't just bloods, so I mean, bloods are sort of like fecal studies as well in, in, in urine analysis. And most people who fall for the two litres of water or eight glasses of water a day myth have problems. Your urine being clear is not what you want at all. It is definitely not what you want to do you need it lightly straw colored if it's dark then you are not drinking enough and if it's clear you're drinking too much so we want it to be straw colored and so when you look at people that aren't affected by mainstream media and uh, the world hoax organization and all those people they don't drink two liters of water a day at all and and really drinking water isn't isn't the best way to hydrate anyway what animal can go across the desert they not drink anything. Well, a camel. What is in that hunt? Fat. And uh, this is like the fructose mechanism. You know, I don't want to divert too much, but I mean, one of the one of the things when when the body and we, again going to so, so, sodium as well. So when the sodium concentration in the blood we talked about so salt, uh, you know, is lower, your body does detect actually that there's a possibility of dehydration. It will actually start in endogenous uh, production of fructose and then that will lead on to other things and the storage of fat fructose is obviously linked to flat, uh, fat production and that fat is then used for metabolic water so got off the subject there sorry about that so, so yes people in the kalahari desert that's hot drink about one liter our en our ancestors water consumption was the next question wasn't it um it's very similar but it's very difficult to actually prove all these things because the arid regions, we can work out from their strategies of how they sort of conserve the water that, you know, 
they didn't have an abundance of water, but it's very difficult to get any direct evidence, obviously, because it's one of the things that, you know, is not going to be stored, so to speak. So everything is sort of primarily indirect evidence. So that, that, is, that is one of the big problems with the, with the question there. With, with, so when you look at wild animals, but we, can, we could look at things like that. So lions, for instance, they go very many days, actually, without drinking water, especially, you know, if they've just eaten. So when we talk about ribeye, when we talk about what is a ribeye made of, well, uh, you know, if you look at a chunk of meat, 70, 71% of that is water. So a lot of water is coming from what we eat. So we see that with lions, for instance, okay? Uh, but again, you know, if you look at, animals that are a bit more notorious for drinking like cheetahs again if there's a, an abundance of prey and they're successful they don't tend to drink that much because they're getting it so they do go by thirst all right and you know as i just said like the desert adapted animal like a camel you know you don't see much water being drunk at all um they have this physiological adaptation the hump full of fat so uh i think that might have answered that question i hope it did like i say with the with the with the water consumption that the two and a half liters eight glasses of water i mean that that comes from a report by a gentleman called ansel keys actually and it was actually a good report he was doing it for the army and he was working out their rations to go into battle and the idea was that it would be the minimal thing for the American forces or the soldiers to take into battle. Well, that makes total sense. You don't want them lugging tents around and all this sort of stuff and tons and tons of, you know, EVN. So he actually said in the report, or researchers did, that the human body needs two and a half litres per day. What was always, that's, so that's cherry picked. So, you, you know, all the bottled water is still still controlled by people like Pepsi and Coke and Nestle and all that. They, they, do a lot of the bottled water. So there's a lot of money in it. The next part of the study was often dropped from conversation because it said, but we can obtain that water from the food that we eat. So we, so that's why I said about the ribeye. You see, I wouldn't have to really drink water if I'm having a nice juicy ribeye twice, twice a day. I would be able to do that. And that's metabolic water as well, which is very low in deuterium and lots of other good things. So, right, getting to the next part of that question. I heard Dr. Cyber say, Clear P means peeing out electrolytes. Well, actually, it becomes clear. And the more you uh, drink too much, yes, you are flushing out electrolytes constantly if you drink too much. It's one of those things which is, which is really strange, actually, because it seems counterintuitive when people are new to this way of eating that, you know, drinking too much can sort of dehydrate you. But overhydration is such a problem for the, for the because it puts your blood pressure up, for one thing. Um it will excrete as much of that water as possible. So for those that, let, let's say I had a blood pressure test and it was low and I was at the physician's, the doctor or the attending nurse or whoever would, would ask me to drink a glass of water. So I would get my, my liquid and uh, this is my excuse to have a drink. And I would drink a lot of it though, not a like little sip like that. And then we'll put my blood pressure up. That works every single time. Absolutely every single time. So drinking too much water is easy to do. The Boston Marathon, the stats are that 11% of the runners at the end of the Boston Marathon, so after running 26 miles, 11% are overhydrated, dangerously overhydrated as well. So we, we need to drink to thirst. We need to get back to that. Should our pee always be yellow, what evidence do we have of the Hadzard's pee? So again, we're, going, we're talking back to going back to tribes and stuff like that. So they're in Tanzania, hunter-gatherer tribe, and um, there's not much information about the urine. It's possibly more concentrated because I doubt that they are into this drinking lots and lots of water. So it might be pale yellow rather than straw-coloured. Um, you know, so I, I, you know, I don't have that information. I would imagine that that would be the, the, the biggest difference. The concentration of urine is actually slightly higher with this way of eating anyway, because there's less, there's less water retention. So if you're carnivore, you might find that you actually have more rapid urination and you also have, you know, better evacuation actually. So it can really be a good thing. So yes, straw colored is good. I'm always saying straw colored is good. Lightly straw colored 
sort of is, is roughly where you should be. But we don't really have the evidence of the heads of P. Sorry about that. Ribeye Rob was just the next person telling people what to do. So anyway, hope, O family, that was good enough answer for you, which is excellent uh, that you asked that question. Right. High intensity. This is what we're going to talk about. High intensity interval training or HIT, as most people call it. Can you explain the mechanism by which high intensity interval training is good for us, in inverted commas, in terms of completely optimal health and longevity. How do high intensity interval training cardio intervals promote a longer life as opposed to just walking, which is low stress, which, you know, is a, a window into why you've asked this question, because exercise is a stress and that would imply that it would impact longevity. And it is actually a net balance thing because you can have too much stress. You can overtrain. That's definitely the case. Or you can undertrain and you won't get the results you want. So you're looking to get a physiological advantage by training. So that's the first thing. So what's, what's going to happen? So the mechanism, if you want to get into the high intensity interval training, what is the mechanism? Well, there's many things. So increased cardiovascular efficiency. What does that actually mean? Well, when you're working really fast and explosively, your body is demanding a lot of nutrients. Okay, so the cell will be trying to uptake as much as possible glucose uh, being obviously one of the examples. Again, I'm going to go off the subjects a little bit. Too many people don't realize that it's not all about insulin. So the, there are there are 14 GLUT, glucose transporters, GLUT1, GLUT2, GLUT3, GLUT4. Now, GLUT4 is the one that is insulin dependent. All the others aren't insulin dependent. GLUT5, I think, is more about fructose anyway. But So anyway, when you are working out in the cytosol of the cell so the cell what happens when you start to work out uh, one thing that happens is you get the translocation of the glut 4 trans transporter it goes to the cell membrane and allows more glucose in so you get this increased cardiovascular ef efficiency but you also become more insulin sensitive so uh, many of my type 2 diabetic patients will do a little bit of exercise i know we're not talking about hit yet with well hit does improve cardiovascular efficiency and cell efficiency and insulin sensitivity but even some less intense exercise will do that sort of thing with slightly less stress so i i have lots of consults with type 2 diabetics in particular and when i was an advanced personal trainer as well i did get somebody to the olympics who was a type 1 so you can overstress your body so it's getting the right balance now when you start doing training you stimulate the release of different sort of hormones like adrenaline and growth hormones. So growth hormone is good because you want to promote muscle growth and fat burning. I think if we go really again global, what does everyone say about longevity? Well, it seems to be correlated. There is an association, can't say cause, of people living longer if they have more muscle. That's, you know, that seems to be the thing. Now, it could be sort of like looking at it the other way. If you haven't got muscle, you're very weak and then and you could have some fractures you could have falls those sort of thing balance bad it might be because of the healthy lifestyle choices you're making people with muscle are they making better choices if you're going to the gym and gaining your muscle you're probably also eating better you're probably also more active and you're not sitting watching the tv as much so that there's more to it than just sort of saying yeah it does this it does that but let's answer the question so the mechanisms are the Increased cardiovascular efficiency, hormonal benefits because your your uh, growth hormones coming out, your muscle growth therefore will improve. It will improve possibly your metabolic rate as well. So you get strength, you get muscle, you get in improved insulin sensitivity. Two of the things that I think are really underrated, and this is one of the real tough ones for me when we talk about overtraining and mental health benefits. So endorphins, which is endogenous morphine, um, if that's how the name came about, when you work out, it can actually get rid of feelings of anxiety and depression. And this is why some people, uh, it's very difficult to tell them to, to dial back. I'm thinking of a couple of clients recently or so who do sort of three, four hours a day of training in different, but not here, by the way, but just, just to get the point across to you. Um, now, they also are quite anxious people. So it, it reduces their anxiety, which is interesting because we just talked about, you know, adrenals going up and, and the hormonal effect. So if you are 
working out, you have to look at the net benefit. You have to say, well, if you didn't work out, how would your anxiety be? How would your depression be? And that, then, then if they say, well, it'll be, t- you know, off the scale, it'll be terrible. Well, then I also go back to doing your exercise. Now, if we go to high intensity interval training, so we've got hit. Well, it really stimulates release of endorphins. It's, that you know, it's quite, quite pronounced, obviously, because you've gone into this super stimulation situation. Again, I wouldn't do it for long. You know, I would do a 10 to 20 minute hit. 20 would be a real push for me. I, I would always recommend 10 to 15 minutes and only like three times a week. I don't think you need to do it a lot. But if your mental health benefits are going to be hit by that, no pun intended, then you might need to do it more often or actually find some other sort of types of exercise that could give you the mental health benefits, but not stress, yeah, fit, stress your body physiologically. And the other thing is repair, cellular repair. You are literally training your body to repair tissue and repair joints. And and there's so many things to exercise. They're just really simple. So if you've got a joint, for instance, so you've got a bone here and a bone here, and in the middle you've got your elbow, that's a joint. Okay, so and when you when your muscle contracts, it you've got the muscle and you've got the tendons which attaches to that bone there, and you've got ligaments and you've got a joint capsule, so no wool fluid. You know, there's a lot going on here, right? So what happens is that between the bone you've got a joint between the bones, and there's synovial fluid in there. Which is, which is fed by the blood, and then you've got ligaments. Now, when you move like this, when you do your bicep curl, you're going to get some friction where the ligament, because the ligament is bone to bone. So underneath the ligament, you've got like what's called um, bursas, little sacs of fluid as well. So there's a lot of fluid going on. And when you start moving, all of these things, they repair a lot quicker. So you want those fluids to be good in the sacs. You want the fluid, the synovial fluid to be as viscous as possible to make that joint as, as healthy. Now, if you're exercising, that's going to happen. Balance, proprioception, which is a posh way of saying, you know, knowing where you are in time and space and coordination, all of these things are improved with exercise. And they're all correlated to longevity. So when I used to do face-to-face rehab before the ridiculous restrictions were brought in, I would have uh, older people who were in the chair that couldn't get out. And on all of this, I can still do remotely as a consultant. You know, so we can do this if you're looking at helping somebody get out of a chair or get out of a Zimmer Frank. And uh, simple things. You know, I'd just get a balloon, blow up a balloon and just play a game where they would have to you know, punch it back and stuff like this. Just get people moving. The corny phrase is, is motion is lotion, but it is absolutely true. But you also want to help with that coordination. You want to help with moving the joints, just getting people. So, I mean, this is free advice. If you've got somebody at home that can't get out of a chair, you've got to start to encourage them. And getting out of the chair is an intense exercise for them because they can't do it. So HIT isn't about going to the gym and sweating and doing insane amounts of work. It's what's really difficult for you. And this this is the nub of the whole thing. If it's intense for you, that is an intense workout. And let's say you're sitting in a chair and you can't get out of a chair. It's really difficult. Well, then you just try and encourage that person safely to try and do it. And maybe do it three times in the space of five minutes. And and that is a high intensity interval training session for the person that finds it really difficult to get out of a chair. You've got to be safe. You you know don't do it if um you don't know much about health and you get somebody in to help somebody like that. But you it can be done, and there's plenty of stuff online about this. So that's the mechanism. So why would that be better than walking? Because of all of those things are not going to happen when you walk. But what's good about walking? Well, good, the good thing about walking is, what, firstly, what is the type of walking? So if it's, if it's hiking, for instance, you've got all these different terrains. You've got unstable surfaces, which, again, works on your proprioception, your balance. Balance is very important for as you get older, so reduce the risk of falling. Sorry, this is a long answer, but it's, you know, it's an it's important one, really. And we haven't got many live questions coming in. So walking is fantastic because you're outdoors. Going back to the question earlier about circadian rhythms, you are seeing the sunlight or the sky or clouds or even inclement weather or cold. 
and your body will be trying to keep you warm and make sure your temperature is correct. And again, if it's a sunny day, it will be regulating your temperature. So walking is what I call, uh, and many other people call, just sort of incidental exercise. It's, it, it's, it's not a, a physiological response that you're after, but you will get some benefits. You're not looking to get bigger muscles or stronger joints. Those sort of things may happen, but it's not, it's not that likely. The people that walk won't look as good maybe as somebody going to the gym, but they might feel better because they're outdoors more and they're getting, uh, you know, a nice workout mentally. Tens, most people tend to walk on a social basis, but, you know, even solitary walking will, will be good for the soul. So I think that walking has its place, but if you were to ask me what I should do, I think it would just hit high intensity interval training would possibly be the sort of the one thing that I would recommend compared to walking. But I would not say that walking is that bad either. So what is bad is neither of those things. So if you're doing nothing, if you're just sitting in your house and you don't do any form of exercise, you've just got to start moving. Because in the end, moving is movement is the thing. That's what you need to do. Even if it's just moving around the house, getting getting out of the chair, moving around the house, trying to be better than you were the day before. So don't just think, well, I've walked around the house. That's it. I've done it. And do it every day. Because what happens is your body is really smart. It gets used to it. And you'll end up not having any further improvements or adaptations. So you've got to push it a little bit, which is great. Get, you know, it's a great thing for you because it gives you a goal and something to do. So uh, hopefully that was... Uh, enough of an answer for you so we've answered this thing about the uh, gurgly stomach just going to move ahead uh, let's have a look so what have we got here yes we've got mark j have we answered this one i don't know i don't think we have uh hands up who thinks we have apart from the occasional carb load i'm strict i'm strict uh, 5 foot 11 185 pounds 10 percent body fat eat three pounds of beef 80-20, so it's 80% fat, 20% uh, protein. Ribeye, six eggs, half a block of butter, but barely maintain weight. No cardio, just walking. Would 100 grams of carbs help? Upping more meat seems too much. That's all I take. No coffee, nothing else. Feel great. Right, so Mark, that is brilliant. The, the, the end of that, the feel great bit is really important for me because that's that's the first thing. Okay, um... If we look at what you're eating, so what are you eating? You're eating three pounds of beef, which is which is really good, isn't it? I mean, that's a lot of beef, a real lot. Three pounds. Okay, so um, what's three pounds? I can't work that out mentally about the protein, but that that is a, a sufficient amount. But I think you could eat more. I wouldn't worry about it being too much because let's go to real basics. You can barely maintain weight. All right. So without numbers, let's do that without number crunching. Let's just look at what you're saying. So you're eating three pounds of beef, ribeyes, six eggs, and half a block of butter. You can barely maintain weight. The answer to that is to eat more. I think eat more protein, certainly. If you're feeling great, that's what I would do. We've got the weight there as well, 185 pounds. You know, I'd have to, your body composition, it all sounds good to me, to be honest. 10% body fat is pretty good, 5 foot 11, 185 pounds, barely maintain weight. If you want to maintain weight, I do think that, you're, you're, if you want to maintain weight, barely maintain weight, I think you're doing the right sort of thing there. But I, I, I would. If you could afford a consultation, I would say a consultation would really help. But you've given me a lot of details there and a super chat. It's very kind of you. But I'd like to dive into that a bit more because I think it's uh, it, it's probably easily, easily fixable to get you to be eating the right amount. But listening to your body is the best thing and your body tells you. So if you feel like you're losing weight every so often and you have to keep eating more, I think we just want to get you to sort of level out. How much should one drink is the next question normally and how much when dealing with kidney issues? Well, that, that's a great question. And um, one of the things you can do, you can email me at zerocarbcoach at gmail.com because I have a kidney protocol. So if you have kidney issues, uh, I do have a lot of success stories about reversing kidney function from sort of five and three. 
uh, beyond 60, to be honest, you know, so get, getting people out of stage five and going through the four, three, two, one, obviously. And then, um, but again, drinking to thirst, you can still use your urine as a guide. Don't drink, uh, two and a half liters. Don't drink eight glasses of water a day. It's not, it's not that most people with kidney issues. Actually, you got to look at the root cause. It's normally diabetes it might be undiagnosed diabetes. So reducing your amount of glucose, carbohydrate intake, is like the nub of it. Ribeye Rob, your super chat was first, was it? Sorry, I've just seen that. Well, it's not come up. I've got to be uh, honest, Ribeye Rob. Let's have a look. Please hit. All oh, right. Yes. Your super chat was please hit the like button to support the channel. Sorry. Rob, I do apologize. Working on my own, I did. Unless you've got a question as well, I do apologise, mate. Sorry about that. But you've been very helpful telling other people how to do the to the question. But going back to the kidney. Uh, yeah, going back to the kidney. Uh, I feel terrible now. Drink to thirst. Make sure that urine is not clear. Make sure it's not dark. Make sure it's straw coloured. And try and get to the root cause of the kidney issues, which is normally some sort of diabetic problem. Yes, you also then get a knock-on effect of high blood pressure. So you may have a diagnosis of high blood pressure because that's easier to diagnose sometimes than diabetes for some places. But I would definitely get you to email zero carb, so zero, how you spell it, Z-E-R-O, uh, carb coach at gmail.com. And I'll just say, I would like the kidney protocol, please, and I'll send that to you. Oh, that's very good. Now, what's the next question? Tourette syndrome. Any success on keto carnivore, keto or which is the best red palm oil versus MCT or... For Tourette's, which is better, this is for a seven-year-old. Well, that's very interesting. I think what I would say is I am I'm very happy to say that I have had consultations with people with this issue. And it uh, was early in my career when I went to low-carb, actually, which was, you know, just over 10 years ago. And even low-carb was, was, was great. Again, I'll try and get the case study up. Let me just see if I can do it. I probably won't be able to because uh, let me just have a look. If I can get that up, that study, that would be great. But I don't want to. Um, she's looking at my computer all, all evening. Let's see if I can get it. If I can't, I would just have to talk to you about it. But yes, yeah, so early on in my career, somebody had that and came to me. And um, just low carb really did reduce it a bit. The mechanism is a little bit or it's, it's unclear. I think it's speculation. But the MCT oil, I suppose the biggest one was the ketone production and the improved metabolism in the brain. That was that was a thing. I can't find the study. Sorry about that. And the anti-inflammatory problem. So I think all of those things. So the brain health, which which is obviously was you know a big. I'm looking at the wrong thing because I'm I'm trying to find the study. There's the camera. It it would. It was probably because of those things that MCT or fat adaption helped because low carb, I then pushed them into more keto. And then I think that, I think that was the, the game changer. I haven't had anyone Tourette come to me while I've been doing carnivore coaching, which is interesting, not because I can't do it, but that just hasn't happened. So I can't speak from first hand experience, but I would say knowing what I know now, I think that you would, you would get all the benefits of carnival. I think it would improve this situation even more. Can't guarantee it. Just cannot guarantee it. But definitely have seen success personally. Obviously, the red palm oil, you know, it's it's a vitamin E, isn't it? So it's, an, it's got the antioxidants in. But I, I, I just feel this way of eating. It's the best way to do it. And CoQ10. But I think you would get those benefits from this way of eating. So, yeah. I would try it. I would, I would just try keto then go keto and then go carnivore just see if the results improve i think it's just trial and error how much are your courses please tam asks my courses right so there's that's a good question uh, we have the school school community so richard and i run a community which is nine dollars a month so that's you know it's not very much money a month nine dollars so it's it's less than a cup of coffee a week. I will put a link in the chat. It's also in the description to this video. And you can join at the end of this because I do an extra 30 minutes after this finishes. Now that, that, that has a live question and answer session every single Monday for an hour. Every single Monday night. 
but you also get playback. So you could leave your question like this. And if you can't attend, you still get your question answered. And also we do this 30 minutes on a Sunday, which is going to go straight after this. So that's that. If you're looking at consultations, uh, you can go to the website, www.theukcarnivore.com forward slash booking, because it depends what you want. If you want uh, blood analysis, if you want personal training, if you want to do a block booking, because that's good for accountability rather than booking an initial session. And if you do an initial ses session, that's slightly more expensive than a follow-up, because obviously a follow-up, I've got all your details. So uh, just look at that on the website. Uh, Dennis, I started taking the supplements when I was having the same symptoms. When I was taking no HCO or Laroxbile, I've taken none today. Same problem starting. I think it is one of those things, Dennis, I know that this is going back to the question at the beginning. It's going to be a period of adaptation and a little a bit of trial and error as well. So I think we've got a Tom here coming up with a thing about Tourette's as well. Dr. Baker has an interview with a lady who used carnivore to treat Tourette's. Yeah, this is the thing. That, you know, because Sean's platform is, I don't know, a hundred times bigger than the school community, there's the chances of had somebody having Tourette's in that group is, is obviously bigger. So, yeah, I think, I think you all find, I think if you did a search of success stories for Tourette's with Carnival, you would find a few people. And you're, you're right, Tom. I think just getting into ketosis is one of the, one of the reasons, like I said, for the less inflammation, ketones to the brain, all that. So let's have a look at this thing here. This is the nice final question. I think this is all we've got time for. I'm going to put a link to the uh, school community. I'm going to do half hour over there. But Zinc 316, would the occasional keto-friendly food be detrimental while adapting to carnivore, missing sour pickles and kimchi? Well, yes, yes, it would be. But um, I would rather you do that than give up completely. And this is one of the things that I'm always saying about carnivore. People say I'm strict carnivore. I'm sort of carnivore-ish. That's fine. If someone comes to me and says exactly what you just said, I want to be carnivore, but occasionally have a gherkin, you know, and if you don't have a gherkin, you're not going to be carnivore at all. I'd much rather you have a gherkin and be carnivore most of the time, because in the end, you're still going to be better than 95% of the people on this planet, or maybe 98% of the people on this planet. I have no studies to prove that, but I'm just saying that's, that's how I would look at it. So yeah, do it. Is it going to be detrimental? Yeah, just it, it just keeps your foot not fully in the carnival camp. So when you're looking at your adaptation of your gut microbiome, when you're looking at adaptation of how much bile production you make, how you manage your blood glucose, it's going to have a little bit of an effect. But to be honest, I think we we become so robust that we could, especially the longer you are sort of mainly keto carnivore, the easier it is to have those occasional things. But in saying that, if you are sugar addicted, for instance, don't have, uh, this is just broadening out the question, don't have anything that's sweet because it might push that addiction a little bit too far. And that's, that's pretty nailed on, I think. So I am now going to get the school community link. If you want to join for the next, if you want to join for the next 30 minutes, you can do that. If you're not a member of school, there's already going to be members over there waiting. I'll put the thing in the chat for you. If you'd like to come over and become a member, you could try it for a month. If you don't like it, you're not tied in. You can just try it. And if you don't like it, you can just leave. That simple. I think you'll like it. Going back to the question about courses, we have loads of courses. That's uh, that's the thing. We have loads and loads of courses. So I'm going to just do a screen share so you can see what happens if you do join the school community. So let me just share that screen. Uh, let's just do that. Get that window up. So if you go to the school community, what will happen is you will see this and you will go to the calendar. Go to the calendar and you'll just click on 8 p.m. question and answers. And here's the classroom. You see, if you're a member, you get all these courses, free keto course, 19 tips to going carnivore, thyroid. All of these have free, or well, not all, but most have free ebooks. Actually, I have done one for 19 tips. So that has a free ebook. That also has a flip book, which is amazing, completely free. Uh, all about dairy, all about fruit and veg, all about protein, problem solving, and then um, there's, there, there's other things you can do. That's a paid for. The last thing, the Fat Club, Richard and I, if you want daily guidance, you can sign up for £25 a month for the Fat Club. So that is the school community. And also you've got, obviously, community feed as well. So I'm going to just stop sharing that. And the link is in the description. So thank you, everybody, who has been watching on YouTube. That's great. 
sorry it was just me if you want to join us on the school community the link is in the chat if not have a good evening we enjoyed this hour and next week we'll be back to normal full strength myself and richard have a good evening